Okay, hi, I'm Professor Scott DiGregorio. I'm an Associate Professor of English here at the University of Michigan Dearborn, and I am the organizer of this event. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to do is uh, um, invite uh, Marty Hershock, Professor of History and Dean of the College of Arts, Sciences, and Letters, who's graciously agreed to come up and uh, say a few words of introduction to get us started. Marty? Great. Thank you, Scott. First, I'd like to uh, uh, take a moment to thank uh, Professor S Scott DiGregorio for uh, organizing this very interesting event. So I, I would uh, uh, encourage you all to join me in uh, thanking Scott for his, his work. <laughs> thank you all for coming out uh, this afternoon to hear this. This is a great turnout. Um, and we welcome you to the University of Michigan at Dearborn and to the College of Art Sciences and Letters. Uh, I'm particularly grateful for uh, the, the faculty and students in the first year seminar program who uh, uh, were instrumental in, in putting this very interesting uh, panel together. So uh, thank you for all of your efforts. It's good to see uh, the audience so full and a lot of interest. There are still some seats down front, so for those of you in the back who are looking for a place to sit, please come down. Um, when I was uh, first asked to, uh, to offer a, a brief uh, welcome and introduction to this event, um, I, uh, I was um, immediately taken by uh, how uh, fortuitous it was because uh, on my Kindle, in fact, I just pulled it up a minute ago, um, I was uh, reading a book called Zealot, the life and times of, of Jesus Christ. So, um, which I've subsequently learned has a number of, of problems. So, um, it, it, it was very, uh, very interesting to me. So, this is a topic obviously of, of great interest uh, for any uh, number of people and for any number of reasons. Um, and uh, what, what particularly drew me to the book that I was reading, but also to the topic of tonight's talk, uh, is thinking about uh, Jesus in, in historical context. And um, that, to me, is a, a, a very interesting exercise and I think uh, is going to be the uh, topic of some really interesting discussions this evening. So I also wanted to thank our distinguished guests for coming uh, today to uh, lend us their time and their expertise. I know that we are all in for a... Um, a particularly enlightening afternoon. And I guess without further ado, I would like to invite Scott back so that he could introduce our speakers and get the program started. And again, for those of you in the back, there still are some <coughs> seats up front here if you wanted to, uh, to make your way here. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, there's some seats down here. If, uh, Bill, if you wanna grab one. There's a bunch sort of down in this area. So uh, the next order of business is to offer uh, a, a, a good amount of sincere thanks to the sponsors for this program, First Year Seminar, and the College of Arts, Sciences, and Letters, and especially Associate Dean Alir Mateza uh, for the generous support that's made this event uh, possible. So some context here uh, for this event. This term, I'm offering a first year seminar on Jesus and the Gospels. And for those who do not know, first year seminars are small classes developed exclusively uh, for first year students to introduce them to the serious intellectual work uh, of university education. Uh, they seek to foster critical engagement at all levels, uh, thinking, reading, writing, and the hope of setting students on a path of deep uh, critical inquiry on which they'll remain during their uh, years here at UM Dearborn. And so when I began tossing around ideas uh, about a, a topic that would meet the challenges demanded by uh, one of these seminars, it seemed to me that something on Jesus and the Gospels would be ideal. Uh, this is a big topic, and everyone has questions about it. Uh, but I want to stipulate um, right at the beginning of this event that I speak here about the historical Jesus. Uh, for it is that flesh and blood individual, a Jew who lived in Galilee in the first century CE, uh, who is the subject of my course and, more importantly, of the discussion that we're going to have here today. Uh, as many of you know, the historical Jesus has been an object of scholarly inquiry for a long time. Indeed, the object of several quests or movements in scholarship that first emerged in the 18th century and continue strong in various forms to the present day, uh, including collaborative panels like the one we're having now. 
So let us ask, what's at stake here? And to be clear, to ask about the historical Jesus is really to ask about methodology. Uh, that is, how one uses the principles and procedures of the modern science of historiography to analyze the sources that we have about Jesus of Nazareth. So the historical Jesus, no less than the historical Socrates or the historical Alexander the Great or the historical Abe Lincoln, uh, is a construction made by historians using the typical tools of their trade in an effort to see uh, the Jesus of history in uh, the historical and cultural context in which he lived. And when I say critical tools, it's important to understand that in English that carries the connotation potentially of negative uh, carping or something, but in uh, the English word that's derived from the Greek verb kernein, it just simply means to make a reasoned judgment about something. Uh, and so that's what we're doing here today. Um, so the question of whether this historical Jesus matches the Christ of faith, that is the Jesus of the creeds, of theological confession, of personal belief, is doubtless for many a pressing question, but it's also another matter altogether, a question for another day. The latest phase of uh, Jesus Quest research has, as far as I can tell, no unifying agenda, and it's characterized by a range of competing hypotheses. But one of its virtues, in my opinion, is a willingness to explore diverse perspectives, to break down traditional barriers, such as the divide between canonical and non-canonical sources in an effort to place Jesus in his own time and to study him in light of all relevant data. And so it's in that spirit that this panel of experts uh, in the field has come together for discussion today. And finally, I just want to emphasize the word discussion. This is not a debate. There will be no winners, no losers. This, the aim is simply to hold a conversation, uh, an exchange of scholarly viewpoints. And so now to our four speakers. Uh, we're very gratified to have them here with us today to share their erudition in the field. Um, there are four, and in the order I will introduce them, that will be the order in which they will speak. First, Gabrielle Boccaccini, Professor of Second Temple Judaism and Christian Origins at U of M Ann Arbor. Saeed Ahmed Khan, Lecturer in Near East and Asian Studies at Wayne State University. Uh, Charles Maybe, Director of Christian Studies at Oakland University. And Robert Price, author, author of uh, many books on Jesus, and whose latest I was told on the car right here is to be entitled uh, Killing History, uh, Jesus in the No Spin Zone, which if you know uh, Bill O'Reilly, you know that this is in some way going to be a response to Bill O'Reilly's uh, recent book, Killing Jesus. Lastly, the format is going to go like this. Uh, the four speakers are each going to make about a 10 to 15 minute uh, speech from the podium, one by one. There will then be a brief uh, gap where we will beg the audience's pardon for a minute while the screen goes up and we're going to have a table uh, whisked up in an instant, and so there will then sit at the table, and there'll be about 10 to 15 minutes of discussion uh, between them in a sort of roundtable fashion, and then we will open up the floor for discussion. We should have a good half an hour for that. There isn't a class in here till 7, so we don't have to be right out of this room at, at 6, so we can go a little over if need be. So without further ado, Professor Boccaccini. That's better. Eh. So thank you very much, uh, first of all, uh, for inviting me. And uh, I was asked to talk about uh, the Jesus uh, as a Jew or from a Jewish point of view. And as you see, I started uh, from uh, a question, eh? quoting uh, Shakespeare. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether was Jesus a good Jew betrayed by his followers, who made him equal to God? Or was Jesus uh, a Christian, a bad Jew, who betrayed his people uh, and put himself above the law of God? For centuries, uh, Christians and Jews uh, have asked themselves this puzzling question, uh, like eternal hamlets, uh, unable to decide uh, whether Jesus uh, was a Jew or a Christian. Ancient Jews uh, were fiercely divided. In the Middle Ages, uh, the Jewish rabbi Yacoub al Kirkizani praised Jesus uh, for his loyalty to the Torah and blamed the evil Paul uh, for creating Christianity as a separate religion. On the other hand, uh, a Jewish pamphlet uh, called the Toledot Yeshua 
depicted uh, Jesus uh, as a sort of magician who wanted to lead Israel away and blasted Jesus as the bastard son of a Jewish mother and a Roman soldier named Pantera. At the end, and for centuries, Jews resigned themselves to think that Jesus was not a Jew, definitely not a Jew. After all, this was also what the Christians believed. When Rembrandt portrayed Jesus as a Jew, this is the, the famous, one of the famous paintings, uh, painters of uh, Rembrandt uh, as a Jew. We had a wonderful uh, exhibition uh, a couple of years ago in, uh, in Detroit. Uh, one of his portraits is also here in, the, in Detroit. So when Rembrandt portrayed Jesus as a Jew, taking a Jewish friend from Amsterdam as a model, his work created great scandal among Christians. The same happened when the French painter Jacques Tissot made Jesus dress like a Jew in the synagogue. It was almost blasphemy. This was the picture by Jacques Tissot in an illustrated Bible. Jesus preaching in the synagogue. This is written in the gospel. Okay? So Jacques Tissot made Jesus look like a Jew preaching in the synagogue dressed like a Jew. If a Christian wanted us Jews to believe uh, that Jesus was not a Jew, why should we contradict them? Why so many thing, with so many things di that divide us, let us at least agree on this. Let the Christian rejoice on their acceptance of a non-Jewish Messiah, and let us rejoice in our unshaken faithfulness uh, to the Jewish covenant. The problem came when militant anti-Semitism began exploiting the non-Jewishness of Jesus as a way to condemn the entire Jewish people as an inferior race. Look what a nice picture we have here. What a beautiful picture. But the author is Adolf Hitler, the German dictator. You know, he was an amateurish uh, painter. Eh? I, I wish he had uh, followed that career. <laughs> uh, look. Uh, this beautiful, harmless uh, picture, but it's not uh, as much harmless as you may think. This uh, Aryan uh, Jesus, this is a portrait of the Virgin Mary and the child, uh, is made uh, purposely to appear to look uh, as somebody who was not a Jew, because in Palestine they were not blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, child, children. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis promoted the idea that Jesus uh, did not belong to the Jewish race. He was not Jewish, he was Aryan, a member of the chosen German race. Hitler uh, even sponsored uh, in Germany a Christian religious institute called the Institute for the Study and Eradication of Jewish Influence on German's Religious Life. You see, Hitler wanted to promote Christianity. Obviously, the Nazi Christianity. The director of the institute uh, was a respectable Christian German theologian, Walter Grudman. After the war, Grudman continued uh, his career uh, as if nothing happened, even though the institute was, was active uh, at the same time in which the Nazis were killing six million Jews around Europe, uh, including seven members uh, of my mother's family. But this is what uh, Hitler uh, and uh, Christian theologians uh, were doing. In those years, unfortunately, a lot of people, not only in Germany, but also here in the United States, and also here uh, in Dearborn. Dearborn, uh, one of the most notorious uh, anti-Semitic journals were published. So many people believe that Jesus could not have been possibly a Jew, as being a Jew was something less than respectable. In those years, however, many Jews began reacting by reclaiming the Jewishness of Jesus, proudly proclaiming, as the Jewish painter Marshall Gall did, that Jesus was one of us. Look at this other beautiful painting. You can admire this painting not far from here in Chicago at the Museum of Art. And Jesus, you see, Jesus is in a scene surrounded by his own people, by his own persecuted people. This picture was made in 1938, at the beginning of the Holocaust. 
Had Jesus lived during the Holocaust, uh, he would have been persecuted, his house burnt, and he would have been sent to Auschwitz. He, his parents, uh, his brothers and sisters, uh, and all his followers, uh, from Peter to John and Paul, they were all Jews. They would be sent, they'd all be sent uh, to Auschwitz. After the Holocaust, uh, it was no longer possible to speak uh, of a non-Jewish uh, Jesus. There are indeed many things we don't know about the historical Jesus. The gospel and later narratives uh, have been highly embellished and mythologized. But one thing we know for sure about the historical Jesus, he was not uh, like this. <laughs> he didn't have long blonde hair and blue eyes. He was not an accidental tourist from Scandinavia <laughs> visiting the Holy Land. <laughs> eh? And he was hardly Christian, according to our standards. He never celebrated Christmas. <laughs> Maybe his birthday, but I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> he was born Jesus. He was not reborn in Christ. He did not receive a Christian baptism, but was circumcised. He never celebrated Easter. He died on that day. He never celebrated Easter. He never read the New Testament. He never enjoyed the letters of Paul, as we do, he but he read the Hebrew Bible. He never celebrated Sunday, but honored the, the, the Holy Shabbat. He never entered the Christian church, but went to the synagogue. Whoever Jesus was, he was born, he lived, and he died a Jew. So who is Jesus from a Jewish point of view? An ordinary Jew, a Jew like everybody else? Not at all. Jesus had certainly some radical ideas, but if we should consider non-Jewish all the Jews who have their own radical ideas, then I wonder how many Jews would be left around. <laughs> Why should Jesus be treated differently than anybody else? The real question is not whether Jesus was a Jew or a Christian. This is a false question. Certainly the historical Jesus was a Jew. The real question is what kind of Jew he was. By emphasizing the great diversity of Judaism at the time of Jesus, contemporary historical research has opened to us, Jews and Christians alike, a third possibility to consider Jesus a reformed Jew, a non-conformist Jew, a sort of Jewish Martin Luther who wanted to reform Judaism and ended up creating a separate religious community. In other words, in order to say that Jesus was a Jew, Jews do no longer need to separate him from this movement, nor in order to say that Jesus was the founder of Christianity, Christians do no longer need to separate him from his people. The Gospel presents Jesus as a Jewish teacher who was baptized by John the Baptist. He was a rabbi and a miracle worker, preached to the crowds and his disciples, announced the end of times and the establishment of the kingdom of God, made a messianic self-proclamation, clashed with the leading authorities of the temple and the Romans, and was killed on the cross as an enemy of Rome. Everything is very well on what we know about first century Judaism. From ancient Jewish sources, especially from the writings of the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, we learn that Jesus was not the only one, not the first one, and not the last one who made the messianic claim. Even Christian sources admit that he could be compared to religious and messianic figures like Theodas or Judas the Galilean, who also made messianic claim. The more we study the figure of Jesus from a historical point of view, the more we realize that the Jewish prophet Yoshua ben Yosef, who you know can call Jesus, makes perfect sense within the diverse and vibrant world of first century Judaism, in a time in which apocalyptic expectations were particularly strong and popular. This does not solve the religious question about the authenticity of Jesus' message. But we should not ask historians to solve religious problems. While Jews, Christians, and Muslims can study together the figure of Jesus from the historical point of view, as we are doing together today, the religious understanding of his role is and will remain different. Jesus presents to Jews the same problem that Muhammad presents to Christians. Jesus and Muhammad came after Moses. And Moses is for the Jews uh, the climax of revelation. However, as the great Jewish rabbi Maimonides used to say, Jews should look at them with some sympathy, and Jesus and Mohammed contributed significantly to the spread of Jewish monotheism around the world, far beyond the boundaries of Israel. The empty between among the three religions should be turned into a competition for peace and good works, because as every Jew, including Jesus, would say, at the end of the time, 
we will all be judged according to our deeds, not according to our beliefs. After all, if God had wanted to create one religion, God would have done so. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bocaccini. Said? Thank you, and um, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the, uh, by the attendance here, and I hope you realize this isn't church, so it doesn't count <laughs> towards your, uh, your Sunday obligations. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. De Gregorio, for, uh, for the kind invitation, and, uh, and certainly to be here with, uh, with friends and esteemed colleagues. It's a, it's a wonderful treat. I remember the last time I was uh, here at U of M Dearborn to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, something of this caliber. It was about the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And similarly, uh, given the tensions that had arisen regarding the movie, and uh, except the only difference is this time I didn't go chronologically where Muslims usually go, which is last out of the three uh, monotheistic faiths. And so we heard from the Jewish representative, we heard from the Christian representative, and then of course I had to say, well, look, we weren't there. Uh, so, uh, but there is some salience from the Islamic perspective when it comes to, uh, to Jesus, and uh, in many ways, uh, the figure of Jesus in Islam is uh, between deification and deicide. Uh, Muslims uh, reject both of these narratives, uh, that they neither consider him to be divine, uh, nor do they consider him uh, to have been uh, uh, the, uh, the victim or uh, the target of a, of a, of a form of deicide. Uh, regarding the historical Jesus, and I know um, as the reference was made earlier to uh, the book Zealot by, by Reza Aslan, and Reza is a friend, uh, and I know that the book is problematic. Uh, we're going to try to deviate from uh, looking at that, if you'll pardon the expression, canonically. When it comes to Islam, this uh, notion of scholarly uh, archaeology, if you will, or examining the historical bona fides of, of Jesus is something that is uh, essentially not done. Uh, it is not really a question from within the Islamic narrative of trying to prove whether Jesus existed or not. In fact, that is already resolved within uh, the Islamic narrative. He did exist. Within the way that Muslims perceive Jesus and the way Jesus is known to them from within the Islamic narrative, it's fascinating to see the construction of uh, the holy book of Islam, the Quran, which is the source then of how one comes to Jesus, so to speak, uh, for Muslims. The Quran is not a chronological uh, uh, narrative. In fact, for anyone who has uh, uh, tried to uh, read the Quran, one realizes that it, uh, it, it tends to have its own coherence, it has its own strategy, it has its own logic uh, within it. It's not, a, it's not a Hegelian book. It doesn't have this sort of positivistic uh, uh, and chronological uh, format. But what it also then demonstrates is that the people of polytheistic Arabia were familiar with the stories of the Old and the New Testament. Because unlike the Bible, which sets up in a literary device the figures that are presented and represented in the, in the Bible, the Quran doesn't have to do this. The Quran, in fact, in speaking in the, in the verses that refer to Jesus and the family of Jesus, refer to him referentially presuming that the people of the Arabian Peninsula already have some level of cultural literacy of the stories of the Bible, which is a fascinating literary device that we find. So there isn't, therefore, the need to set up an awful lot of the construction of who Jesus was and going into a lot of the biographical details. It's a wonderful way of then presenting Jesus to Muslims, but of course uh, the opportunity cost of that is that a lot of the historical establishment that one finds in the Bible is not presented uh, in that sense. What we do know in the Quran is the genealogy of Jesus going back at least two generations. The Quran has at least two chapters or surahs that are devoted to the family of Jesus. One is a chapter referred to as Surah Maryam, an entire chapter, one out of the 114 in the Quran that are named for Mary. And in fact, Mary has the very exalted position within Islam and within the Quran itself of being the most frequently cited woman in the Quran. 
more so than uh, any other woman, including uh, the Prophet's uh, a wife, Khadija, or the Prophet's daughter, uh, Fatima, or anybody else for that matter. What we do know in the Quran is the genealogy of Jesus, known as Isa, being the son of Maryam, Mary. And in fact, in the Quran, this is exactly the way that Jesus is referred, Isa, uh, son of Maryam. And we find that his grandparents are also mentioned in another surah entitled Imran, which is named after his grandfather, the family of Imran, i.e. the family of Mary herself. So we find out that Imran, known uh, biblically as Amram, uh, is married to Hanna, uh, who for Byzantine uh, experts will know as Saint Anne, and that their ancestor is uh, Fakud. Now Fakud has another child named Ishba, who is married to Zachariah, whose progeny is Yahya, or John the Baptist. So we find then that the family tree is established right off the bat when it comes to the cousin relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist, and this is then confirmed within uh, the Quran. This idea then of how Jesus is presented to Muslims by reference provides both the context and the continuity of how within Islam, Jesus is one of a series of prophets dating all the way back to Adam himself, the original son of man, and then continuing through, including uh, such names which would be familiar to those uh, scholars and students of the Bible, including Noah, including Abraham, uh, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, uh, some prophets that are not named in the Bible, uh, and then also including from the New Testament, Jesus and uh, John the Baptist, both of whom are considered to be great prophets uh, within the religion. And the level of respect that is conferred upon Jesus in Muslim discourse is the same as how it is to Muhammad. The idea that all of the prophets are confirmed with, uh, conferred with the appellation, peace and blessings be upon him. So we find then that there is a parity and a fraternity, if you will, of prophets within uh, the Islamic uh, condition. Also, we find that there are stories which are affirmed within the Quran regarding the biography of Jesus. First of all, dealing with uh, the virgin birth itself. For Muslims, the virgin birth of Jesus is at the same time remarkable and unremarkable. And let me explain to you the contradiction in terms. It is remarkable because, after all, a virgin birth, by definition, it tends to be remarkable. But at the same time, among prophets, it is not considered to be remarkable because, after all, Adam himself was born in a remarkable way. So one of the distinctions that is made between Islam and Christianity uh, regarding whether the virgin birth of uh, Jesus is dispositive of his divinity in any way is therefore refuted uh, from an Islamic uh, logical construction of saying, well, since Adam also was not born of, uh, of an ver um, uh, unremarkable birth, therefore, and he wasn't uh, divine, then therefore that claim could not uh, be made about Jesus. He is a prophet, according to the Quran, who is imbued with the Holy Spirit. So I suppose from an Islamic perspective, if I were talking to a Christian audience, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> Regarding the notion of the Messiah, when it comes to Islam, there is the acknowledgement that Jesus is coming back. It is not Muhammad. And I'll explain and, and, and delve into it a little bit more deeply in a minute about this historical division of comparing Jesus and uh, Muhammad and what have been the repercussions of that between the two faiths. According to Islam, at the end times, when things get bad, or some of you who are pessimistic will say get worse, uh, we'll find then that Jesus will return and will be partnered with the Mahdi, who in Islamic terminology is somebody who will also help to bring about and usher in an era of peace and prosperity on earth. Now, how does Jesus come back is a question that, of course, also then implies that we have to figure out where did he go. And Islamically speaking, there is the acknowledgement of the crucifixion as a historical event. 
The issue, though, in Islam is that Jesus himself was not crucified. And in the Quran, it says that they say, and you have to love the generic they because it's a term that we also like to use. They say that Jesus was crucified. They say we killed Jesus. You say to them that they did not. And this is God speaking in, in the Quran. Tell them that they did not. According to Islamic belief, Jesus was raised into occultation because he would not suffer such an ignoble death as would be uh, that on the cross. And he is currently in occultation and will therefore return at the end times. Upon the vanquishment of evil, according to Islamic tradition, Jesus will then uh, usher in a period of peace and will then die a mortal death as every human must. According to Islamic tradition, he will be buried next to the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet's companions at the mosque in Medina. And in fact, there is one empty grave that is, by tradition, left empty. We find that when it comes to the message of Jesus, this is something that was not contradicted by Muhammad. The message of Christianity, however, was something which was contradicted and was refuted both by Muhammad and by the Quran insofar as the claim of Jesus's divinity. And we find if you read the book Allah, Christian Response by Yale Divinity uh, School scholar uh, Miroslav Wolf, a lot of the same issues and a lot of the same misperceptions regarding the divinity of Christ and the Trinity within Christianity are issues that are not just ones that vex Muslims, but also that vex Christians throughout history. So it's fascinating to see how these are both inner as well as external uh, dialogues and debates that have been going on uh, throughout history. So why then so much of the animus throughout the centuries between Islam and Christianity over the figure, the persona, and the essence of Jesus? Well, first of all, I would contend it has a lot to do with patenting. Uh, Jesus has been patented by Christianity, uh, particularly when it comes to the issue of divinity. And unfortunately, also, Muhammad has been patented by Muslims, uh, quite contrary to the idea that both of these historical figures were meant to be very universalistic in their reach. But a lot of it also has to do with the political dimensions which began with the earliest encounters of Islam and Christianity. After all, only three years after the Prophet's death in 635, Muslim armies from the Arabian Peninsula leave the peninsula and capture Damascus. Three years later, they capture Jerusalem, both of which were parts of the Byzantine Empire. So we find that from some of the earliest inceptions of Islam itself, there has been at least politically and militarily, a contentious uh, relationship between the two. But a lot of binarisms were then set up between these two figures. The idea of, is this really a competition between Jesus and Muhammad? Well, how then do we frame the debate? Is it a matter of Muhammad challenging Jesus's divinity? Well, of course not, because Muslims themselves will contend that not only was Muhammad human, but so was Jesus. Is this an issue of celibacy versus Muhammad being a family man? Who knows? Certainly the aspersions historically that were levied against Muhammad of being the antichrist, of even being a pedophile, are ones that still unfortunately gain currency in our discourse today. Perhaps worst of all, and it seems as though this is the real needle that people want to place into the eye of Muslims or into the eye of Muhammad, is that Muhammad was a plagiarist that Muhammad simply pinched from Jesus and from Christianity and from Judaism all of this divine message of monotheism. And in that sense, Muslims have to say guilty as charged. Muslims have never claimed to have been an original religion. And in fact, it is perhaps the highest form of affirmation and validation that they are not original. The fact that they believe that the continuity of monotheism and the divine message has continued unabated from the time of Adam, then simply proves to them, and is the message that they like to convey, that they are part of that contiguity. And in fact, in the end time, according to Muslim belief, Jesus will come back and will make the claim that the six centuries that transpired between his ministry and Muhammad's 
are simply then both a continuation, a clarification, a confirmation, and a perfection of that divine message, which had not begun even with Jesus, but had begun with Adam himself. So we find then that unfortunately there is this king of the hill mentality when it comes to Jesus and when it comes to Muhammad as figures that the movie Highlander would say there can be only one. When it comes to Islam, this has never been a contentious issue. There is, of course, within the uh, Muslim conceit that Muhammad simply completed the seal of prophethood. And intellectual honesty requires me to say that unfortunately, Muslims then do exempt Muhammad sometimes, perhaps subconsciously, from the longer continuum of the prophets. This, I think, is a blind spot and unfortunately also tends to be a reaction to the level of animus that is placed against Muhammad. But if one takes a look at the position of the historical Jesus and even the theological Jesus from within Islam, and with all due respect to what we've already heard, Jesus was a Muslim. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Carr. Professor Maybe. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, also, I want to thank Scott, and it's uh, great to uh, see a number of old friends uh, and this uh, well-attended event. Uh, several years ago, we had a debate at Oakland University um, around the role of religious studies in a state university. And on the panel was a gentleman, who's on the faculty, who argued, why do we need religion? We got churches on every corner. Uh, well, you know, uh, it's easy to dismiss that argument or disagree with that argument. Uh, but I, wanted, I want to take his challenge seriously and to fold that in to the topic that we're talking about today. It's, it's an authentic question. We got churches everywhere. I don't really have to tell you what the Christian view, unlike Saeed maybe, who has to explain uh, more in our culture uh, of the Islamic view. The Christian view is fairly well known in our parts of the world. Um, but our, I would argue that, that the university, and we sort of hopefully represent that here, and certainly in terms of setting we do, represents a sacred space. A, a space set aside where great religious teachings, uh, exploration, uh, intellectual exploration, uh, examination, can be done as objectively as possible, as human beings um, are capable of objectivity. So the perspective I'm coming from is not simply the Christian Jesus. Again, that uh, view of Jesus is pretty ubiquitous, uh, readily available on most street corners uh, in our society. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested, and in speaking out of the Christian tradition, but I'm interested in the Jesus that predates the rise of historical consciousness in the, in the academy. For science, which informs so much of our study, historical study, at least methodologically, uh, cannot capture the Jesus of faith. And that's really the argument that I want to make uh, primarily uh, to you in this setting. Uh, we, we basically, as Scott said in the beginning, have a methodological issue before us when we look at this figure of Jesus. And the methodological issue is from a scientific standpoint, what do we believe? Who do we believe? What sources do we, do we believe? 
Uh, how do we evaluate sources from the, from the ancient world, from the past? Were these sources friendly to the church? Were these, were these sources hostile to the church? Um, corroborative sources, such as the Gospels, uh, from a historical standpoint, are problematic. They have an ax to grind. Whether you, you buy the ax <laughs> or you buy the grind or what, they have a tendentious point that they want to make. And from a historical standpoint, the way history works in the academy, those sources are not as reliable as more what we might call metaphorically hostile witnesses. If, if you have the support of a hostile witness, that's worth a lot more than a cooperative witness. Uh, by the way, how many Gospels were there? Um, and, uh, you know, it's an interesting question, and I, I did have an opportunity earlier uh, in my career to participate uh, on, the, on the sideline of the Jesus Seminar, and some of you have uh, heard of, probably of the Jesus Seminar. And uh, I remember hearing Bob Funk, who, who founded uh, West Star Institute that sponsored the Jesus Seminar that wanted to get back to the historical Jesus. He said, I'm going to call the book The Five Gospels. And some of you, if you've studied this topic, know of this book published by the Jesus Seminar, The Five Gospels. Well, right there, you said a lot. Because if you go back to your King James Bible and count them, you only find four. Well, his point was, it was kind of in your face, and he was kind of an in your face sort of guy. Um, his point was, there were, not only were there things in the Gospels that, that were attributed to Jesus, and we have, we being historians, have come to believe were attributed to Jesus. He didn't say them historically. Um, but there are things in the Gospel of Thomas that didn't make it into the New Testament that Jesus actually did say. Therefore, the five Gospels, the five Gospels being the New Testament of the Academy, not the New Testament of the church. I remember, um, and I hope I can uh, cite you, you uh, will forgive me if I misrepresent something, but I was in dialogue informally at one point with um, an Islamic uh, gentleman. It was, not a, it was not an imam, it was a, it was a businessman and we were talking. I can't remember literally what, what the event was. And he said something about the gospel. And uh, I was kind of quizzical because again, my King James Version has four Gospels, and he said, the Gospel. And I said, well, what, what do you mean exactly by the Gospel? And he said, you know, the, the original, the one before it was corrupted into four. Well, I want to make the argument, I, and I'm not here to critique any particular point of view with regard to that, but I, but I do want to, to underscore from a Christian perspective the fact that we have four Gospels, and uh, we all know three of them more agree than, than they do with the Gospel of John and so forth and so on, but in general, there are differences in the four Gospels. I see that, and, and from a historical point of view, and from a Christian point of view, I see that as a positive, not a negative. And uh, recently I've become interested in uh, game theory of all things. And uh, interesting in economics, game theory, we, we sort of, particularly in interfaith dialogue, have a presupposition that if we can agree on things, that that's good. But you know what? Agreement in economic theory is sometimes called collusion. 
And a good, healthy economic system em embodies within it competition as well as collaboration. There was competition in the early church from the beginning of who Jesus was. And that, I would maintain, was not a bad thing, that this was a healthy thing. Uh, obviously within a framework of accepting certain ground rules or game rules uh, of, of the situation. Well, in terms of, um, I'll try to f finish this up because I know we don't have that much time. Uh, you know, I could, I could read to you the Nicene Creed to give you the traditional Christian understanding of Jesus. Uh, one part of that, uh, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. I mean, this is pretty standard issue. Uh, Christian faith. Um, but I would like to read you now a passage from one of those Gospels that I mentioned earlier in the New Testament, namely the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28, in case you're following along with your King James Bible. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Well, um, there's quite a distance between that vision of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew by the way, the most beloved of the Gospels uh, in the history of the church, um, and the Nicene Creed. It, it's a fairly large chasm within the bosom of Christianity itself. Two quite different competing views of Jesus. The chasm that exists between them helps us better understand the chasm that exists between faith and history. And I'm just going to conclude, because say, elaborate this, but to, to get to the point. What I want to end with is basically, I want to keep both critical historical scholarship that acknowledges the chasms in our historical past on the, on the table and I want to keep faith on the table as well. But what I don't want to do is to, is to collapse those two things and pretend that they're one and the same. They are not. And we must keep them separate. Where will that lead us? I don't know. It's a kind of two-piston engine if you will, that will take us somewhere that I hope we need to go. I'm not sure where it is, but I'd like to be along for the journey. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Mavy. Our final speaker, Bob Price. Yeah, I look like Santa Claus. <laughs> I'd keep that in mind uh, when you have the questions to ask, because you know the drill, stocking full of coal, and so forth. Um, you know, the, the, the various things here, I just got a comment on it, so interesting, the uh, misunderstanding of Islamic uh, views of Jesus in the West is staggering. I remember once a seminary, a New Testament professor in a seminary class uh, was asked by a, a young guy that wanted to become a, a Christian missionary to Muslims, he says, how do you explain the virgin birth of Jesus to a Muslim? And the professor said, well, that is a tough one. I thought, what the hell? Muslims believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Uh, I was at another thing where this guy who was a college professor of Islam and African religions said, well, you know, uh, in some ways Islam is more like Judaism than Christianity because neither Jews or Muslims believe Jesus is the Messiah. What? Uh, of course they do. Oh, brother. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, by the way, there's, a, I think, a 12th century Islamic scholar, uh, um, Abd al-Jabbar, who says that in his day there were 88 known gospels used by uh, Christians, and we do know of nearly that many of, of all different stripes. Some of we just have the titles of, but it's, it's pretty interesting, the lore that was preserved there including one other thing I just got to mention. Uh, there is uh, a lot of very fascinating stuff about Jesus in Islamic sources, uh, outside of the Quran even, and uh, I collected uh, oh, over 100 sayings of, that are preserved in uh, a work by uh, Al-Ghazali, the great Sufi scholar, that sayings attributed to Jesus, and some of them are really knockouts. Uh, there are a couple of places you can read these, but I have a book called The Pre-Nicene New Testament where I've extracted all of them and comment on them. It's just amazing stuff. It's like you've never read the gospel before, and then you read this. It's utterly fascinating. Anyway, um, I have been a member of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I've been a fellow of the Jesus Seminar. I've been a Baptist pastor, albeit a theologically liberal one. I've held uh, conservative views. I've, I've uh, moved on over the decades to critical views like those uh, Bart Ehrman espouses famously today. Uh, but eventually, I found my gra myself gravitating to a position I used to think was virtually insane and certainly never thought I would espouse, and that is that there was no historical Jesus at all, that uh, Jesus is mythical all the way down. And uh, I, I, I used to think it was crazy. You probably do too. You probably will when I'm done. But let me just give you the basic rudiments of why this seems to me uh, so plausible a theory, though, of course, one can never know unless you've got a time machine you're willing to lend me. Uh, uh, but it, it seems to me so plausible an alternative, I should think that the burden of proof is on the person that would say there was a historical Jesus. Well, the first thing is there's such a thing as the mythic hero archetype. There's a kind of a set of traits and events and so forth that recur in the stories of many mythical and, and half-mythical legendary uh, people from the Buddha to Alexander the Great, to Plato, to Krishna, uh, to Apollonius of Tyana, to King Oedipus, and so forth, and see if any of these things ring a bell. There's often an, a divine enunciation, a god announces to a, a, a woman that she is going to bear this great supernatural son, and, uh, and then she does so in an irregular way. She might be a virgin, she might be married, but be impregnated by a god, etc. Then uh, as uh, there, there are signs heralding the birth, and when he gets a little older, the, uh, the, the savior, the hero, is uh, a child prodigy and knows more than, the, than his teachers do and so forth. Uh, he embarks on a ministry with some sort of an initiation rite, as with Jesus and Zoroaster, it was a kind of a baptism, and, and immediately here comes the devil, whatever name he bears in the different religions, and he tries to throw the, the hero off the track with temptations, but of course he'll have none of it and continues on in his uh, mighty mission, which includes often healings and exorcisms. And um, there may even be stories where his ability to heal is contrasted with that of traditional shrines and medicine and doctors and so on, so that you know, he's, he's the great one, whether we're talking about Apollonius or Asclepius or whatever. Uh, then uh, eventually uh, the, uh, he's uh, given great popular acclaim, sometimes considered to be a king, whether metaphorically or literally. And uh, 
uh, then uh, the people turn against him. He is put to death often on top of a hill. And uh, then there is confusion over where the body is, or where was he buried, nobody seems to know, as in uh, Moses and Deuteronomy. And there may be uh, an ascension into heaven, and before or after that, or both, there are appearances of the divine hero to his mourning disciples, in which he gives them a charge to go carry on his legacy. Uh, these bits and pieces, many of them, are told again and again, independently, as far as we can tell, about all sorts of figures all over the world and throughout history. Some of them may well have existed as historical figures, but there's not that much uh, left over of a secular nature, you might say. If there was, I would say the Buddha, for instance. There might have been a Buddha, but it's highly doubtful. And I think the same is true about Jesus. Uh, of course, every one of these items I mentioned it occurs in the stories of Jesus in the Gospels. Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big comic book fan. I love superheroes. I see all the movies and all that stuff. If somebody were to say to me that, uh, uh, you know, Superman really existed. Now, Captain Marvel, the Martian Manhunter, these are, of course not. They're, they're just uh, fictitious superheroes. It's all imagination. But Superman really existed. <laughs> you wouldn't really take that seriously. Uh, unless you perhaps w grew up believing that Superman was real, going to a faith community that uh, worshipped Superman and, and so on, uh, then you might find it hard to, to think out of that box. But it seems to me, yeah, why should we take one of these stories with all of these elements in it, the most exaggerated one of the bunch, and say, yeah, this time it really happened? Now, of course, you can say, well, the figure was embellished. There must have been a historical Jesus behind that. Well, there might have been. That certainly could be true, but there is no way to tell. And partly that's because there's no secular biographical information about Jesus. Nothing about what he looked like, nothing about his education, uh, precious little about his family and, and so forth. It's all miracle stories and drama and melodrama and myth. Once you take that away, there is nothing left. Uh, Saint, uh, not Saint, uh, Emperor Augustus, uh, his biography became embellished with many of the same traits, but big difference there is that we know quite a bit about him. He is stitched irrevocably into the history of the ancient world. There's no way there was no Caesar Augustus, right? And the same with uh, some of the others. But with Jesus, the few places where he seems to be clamped on to history, the stories that associate him with Herod the Great, Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, I uh, have long been been recognized as severely problematical, filled with implausibilities and even absurdities from a historical standpoint. Uh, the characters do things they would never do, and uh, history says they didn't do otherwise, and so on and so on. It begins to look to me, and of course I don't know this, right, and I don't care what you think of it, but just explaining the so-called mythicist view, it seems to me this represents an attempt to anchor an originally purely mythic, purely divine Jesus into history, and that for institutional reasons, as there was more and more competition between Gnostic and Marcionite and other uh, early Christian groups, and people had revelations from the heavenly Christ left and right, one party decided, no, to undercut this, to secure our authority. We have to posit that there was an our founder, a guy that actually started this in recent history and appointed the guys who trained and appointed our leaders as their successors. It seems to me it's, in other words, no, uh, no problem to imagine how and why a mythical Jesus was transformed somewhere along the line, and who knows, uh, into uh, an ostensible historical figure. Uh, quickly, just um, another thing. When you look at the sayings and the stories in the canonical Gospels, uh, and the Jesus Seminars you know, pointed out, uh, they finally voted after years of debate on this, and this doesn't mean what they came up with was true, obviously. I, I, don't, I don't hold to a nose count epistemology. I mean, you know, two million Mustang owners can be wrong, right? Uh, well, these guys thought that only 18% of, of both the sayings and the stories in the Gospels really very likely went back to Jesus. And, and I've argued uh, in a book that uh, if you apply the same criteria, really, there's virtually nothing left. They're, they're just inconsistent. That assuming there was a Jesus that is, was a wandering preacher of the kingdom,
kingdom of God. Uh, so much else is, uh, is anachronistic and doesn't fit into that. Uh, so it, it seems to me anything that looks likely to have come from such a figure reduces to the vanishing point. But I think the thing that really pushed me over the edge into saying, yeah, I, I think this is more plausible, uh, is uh, the uh, study that many scholars have made, and, and I sort of researched it and combined it into a, a, a list of interpretations, virtually every story in the Gospels and even in the book of Acts are very likely simply rewrites from the Greek version of the Old Testament, of the Septuagint. Again and again, once you compare this story of Jesus, boy, does that look like Elijah raising a somebody's kid from the dead, stilling of the storm, boy, everything in there comes out of Jonah, it looks like it. Uh, Peter's vision of the, the sheet with the animals telling him that they're all kosher, this looks so much like a vision out of Ezekiel, and so on and so on. I was shocked. I mean, I hadn't thought of this before, except in a very few cases. Virtually everything, I, I think, except the rich young ruler story, I don't know where they got that, but virtually every one of them looks like a, a rewrite from the... Uh, from the Septuagint, and then you have to ask yourself as a historian, what is more likely, that a guy was born of a virgin, uh, healed all these people effortlessly, again, as if it were Superman doing it, sure, I'll heal you, sure, I'll raise your uh, son from the dead, uh, it, it, that, uh, that he, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, changed water into wine, what's more likely, somebody really did this, or early Christians rewrote famous stories? I mean, what are the chances? What's the, the more likely uh, uh, explanation? Now, one can say, well, it's certainly it's likely that he could have done these things and did if he was the son of God. But you see, that's circular and deductive. You say, if you already believe the story is history, then there's no problem believing it's history. But if you try to step outside of that and say inductively looking at the evidence, what does it look like? One more collection of myths and wise sayings or a real account of somebody who was basically an ancient Superman? I, I know I'm a, a smart ass. I, I don't have any ax to grind against the Christian faith, which I love and revere as I do all the faiths. They're endlessly fascinating. They're, they're at the very least wonderful constructions of the human spirit. I'm not some sort of village atheist. I, I despise that <laughs> approach. Uh, uh, these, I call them uh, Westboro atheists that try to get rid of Christmas. I hate that stuff. Uh, I, I uh, don't have a dog in that race, uh, but I don't really have a god in that race either. Uh, I realized from my Christian upbringing I have to uh, seek the truth no matter what the sacrifice. I learned that from the Bible and the church. And I was very surprised to come to a crossroads where I felt like to be consistent, I'm going to have to choose between faith and the Bible and being intellectually honest. I know there are many others that uh, don't uh, think it's a matter of that. I'm not trying to convince you that I'm right, but this is a perspective one seldom hears or at least hears fairly presented. And so. It seems to me it is quite likely that there was no historical Jesus and that it is uh, easy to explain the origin of Christianity without one. There's uh, the Mithraic religion was once the great world religion of the Roman Empire. Mithras, the savior, never existed. Uh, there's a lot of Hindus that believe in Krishna, an incarnation of Vishnu, but there's no way. Krishna ever existed. It's all myth, and it shouldn't be surprising that this ancient Superman named Jesus wouldn't have existed either. Of course, I don't know, right? That's just the theory I favor, and it's just another perspective for you to consider and do with as you please. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to get started again. Uh, what we'll do now is take about 15 minutes. I think each of the speakers will probably make a short comment, uh, and then uh, this will lead into discussion amongst them. Uh, that should go on for 15 minutes. So there, there isn't a class in here until 7, so we can go a little bit uh, over time if need be. Uh, so we'll have about 15 minutes of conversation, and then we'll open up the floor for the Q&A. Gabriel, you want to start? Ah, okay. That's having a very, very lively debate. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to make only two comments. So first of all, I think from the four of us, uh, we have you have understood very clearly that one thing is to talk about the historical Jesus, uh, and one thing is to talk about the interpretation of Jesus. So, if you are talking uh, of the interpretation of Jesus, uh, we can only state uh, our differences. 
From a Christian point of view, Jesus is the Son of God. From a Jewish point of view, Jesus uh, is a rabbi. From a Islamic point of view, Jesus uh, is a Muslim. Okay? We have to live with these differences. From a historical point of view, instead, uh, we may have a conversation uh, regardless of our personal belief. Because uh, our uh, understanding of historical Jesus uh, does not depend uh, on what we believe about Jesus. It's simply a matter of historical research. There are uh, a lot of people that have different opinions about the historical Jesus, uh, and their opinions uh, do not reflect their faith. Okay, so I think that the first thing that we have learned from this debate is uh, that we have to keep these two levels completely separated. One thing is to talk about the interpretation of Jesus from a religious point of view, from an atheistic point of view, etc. And one thing uh, is to talk about uh, the historical Jesus. So the second observation is about the historical Jesus. I completely disagree with what <laughs> Robert has said. No surprise. Okay. <laughs> but, but of course, not because of reasons uh, of, uh, of faith, uh, but as an historian. There is a, there is a, a debate among historians about the historical Jesus, whether or not this Jesus was an historical character. You may be surprised, but personally, I'm more prepared to admit that Moses never existed than to admit that Jesus never existed. You may find it a paradox, but this is, uh, as an historian, uh, is what I have to tell you. Because uh, while I agree, for instance, that we don't have uh, a lot of evidence uh, or that Moses existed as an historical character. As an historian, I believe that the evidence that Jesus existed as an historical character is not a very strong, it's overwhelming. This is my opinion. Uh, of course, uh, I, I, am, I am glad that I am the majority, because this is the majority opinion of, of scholars uh, on the historical Jesus, uh, but the fact that you are in the majority doesn't mean that you are right. Okay? Why I'm saying that the historical Jesus uh, is that Jesus was an historical character? First of <coughs> all, because uh, I believe, I agree perfectly with you on one thing, that the way in which uh, the narrative, the gospel narrative are constructed uh, is largely mythical. That's true. Whoever wrote the Gospels uh, took a lot of suggestions uh, from uh, uh, myth, ancient myth, and uh, ancient biblical stories. So I perfectly agree on the fact that if you read the Gospel, you have to keep in mind uh, that these are not uh, words uh, of uh, eyewitnesses, are not words uh, of a journalist. Uh, it's not a work uh, of, uh, of uh, somebody that was super partis. I mean, these are narratives written by people who wanted to preach the gospel, and they built a narrative uh, with myths. Nevertheless, I think, and this is our disagreement, I think that uh, what we can infer from these narratives, from the historical point of view, is more than sufficient uh, to sustain the idea that Jesus uh, was a Jewish preacher who lived in the first century. Why? Because the figure of a Jewish preacher in the first century, preaching the coming of the kingdom of God, proclaiming to be the Messiah, fits very well, it's not anachronistic, fits very well with what we know about first century Judaism. Because Flavius Josephus is offering description of many other people that did many things similar to Jesus. The second reason is this. If 50 years after the death of Jesus, uh, I want uh, to create uh, a mythical character. I do not create uh, stories uh, that contradict my point of view. The gospel narratives are full of stories, like the fact that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, of the theology of the Son of Man uh, that nobody could understand anymore. Uh, why a person that is creating a myth about Jesus uh, is creating stories uh, that his readers uh, could not even understand? So it means that there was some traditional material that these people were using, some earlier material. And because the distance is only 50 years, this early material goes back to Jesus himself. Uh, I think that is circular because if Jesus was a myth, the bottom drops out of it and you can't say 50 years after. 50 years after what? 
uh, if, if Jesus was another Osiris or, or something. So the, the timeline is a function of accepting the story as history, so I think that's circular. Plus this criterion of, uh, of embarrassment, as it's sometimes called. Like, why would you have a story that embarrassed later Christians? Oh, man, Jesus was baptized by John. The John sect is making a lot out of that. I wish it hadn't happened that way. Well, uh, what was offensive to one generation hadn't necessarily been to a previous one. Uh, so the fact that, uh, that s certain vestiges and fossils appear in the Gospels that are... Uh, uh, like taken from Mark and in Matthew and he changes them, that doesn't mean they had to be uh, history. It's just that this was an earlier form of faith. I mean, it, we can't be sure that it was not more than an earlier form of faith. Like there are, uh, there are various, I can think of at least three from Acts and Romans, statements about how Jesus became the Son of God as of his resurrection. Well, that sure doesn't fit the predominant view as it later emerges. But you see, that's not a question of history. Uh, whether Jesus was adopted as the Son of God at some subsequent point or was virgin born or whatever, you're talking about clashing faiths about Jesus. Uh, so it's, it's just, it need be no more than stages of development of the Christian theology or the Christian myth. Uh, sorry. One only thing to clarify, to say that something is historical in Jesus, uh, I don't want to say that everything that is written right. in the Gospel uh, is historical, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, I don't want to right. be misunderstood. Sorry. Uh, okay, I appreciate the NSA providing these uh, microphones yeah. for us. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a wonderful event. I, I want to uh, congratulate you and uh, just the vitality and the interest. This is what religion really should be doing, right, you know, around the world rather than uh, shooting at each other or whatever. Uh, I thought one of the most interesting um, statements made um, uh, today was uh, my friend Saeed, who said that Islam does not claim originality. I thought this, this is really interesting. I'd never heard that before. It, of course, makes perfect sense within the context that, that he laid that out. Um, I think much could be said about Jesus as well. I don't think there's a lot of originality with Jesus. However, I do think there is with Paul. And that's the interesting question. The real question that, uh, that, 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 we ha that we need to get to and the kind of silent partner at the table uh, in this discussion, our colleague or whatever, is really Paul because Paul was an original thinker. In fact, um, I, I met um, um, invented Christianity among other things, you know, uh, in his uh, life. Uh, I, I remember... Um, meeting a uh, 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 graduate school professor that many years later after I started graduate school studying New Testament and ended, ended up studying Old Testament. And I met him about 15 years later, a brilliant guy and so forth, and I said, uh, well, I, I finally reached the point where I can summarize the New Testament in four words. Now, this was a very erudite, or is, I mean, he's still alive, very erudite individual, and he said, really? <laughs> and what might those four words be? And my answer was, the book of Paul. The New Testament is the book of Paul. And all Christian thought begins, and I agree, by the way, that uh, I think it was Gabriella who said that, in, that Jesus is not really Christian. The first Christian is Paul. And everything that we talk about in terms of the Christ of faith um, goes through, it's the I-75 the I of the New Testament. It goes from uh, wherever, uh, the Mackinac Bridge to Florida or whatever it is, you know. It's the spinal column. And if you really want to understand what's going on in the New Testament and the portrayal of Jesus in the New Testament, Begin your studies with Paul. Um, the, I'm going to throw out one other just tidbit. I'm not going to follow this one up. I've never said this. I don't think I've ever said this publicly. But, you know, it's an interesting little fact that I think has more significance 
than than uh, than you than uh, than you average than you would think of in an average uh, conversation about these these matters. The New Testament doesn't claim that Jesus was the Messiah. The New Testament was written in Greek. It claims that he was the Christ. Now, the assumption is that Christ and, and Messiah, you know, they're the same thing. But it's, you know, if you study language, um, no two languages are exactly the same. And I think it's that it's, uh, I mean, it's understandable that, you know, that this was picked up, but I think it's worth exploring. What does this mean that Jesus was the Christ uh, rather than the Messiah? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, again, I, I want to really uh, uh, thank uh, the organizers of this, uh, this event. And uh, as I was telling Charles, uh, I'll be perplexed on my drive home uh, with, with a lot of what I've, what I've heard today and, and really processing these things. Uh, and I also want to uh, uh, express my bittersweet uh, uh, acknowledgement that um, my streak is broken for being the, uh, the most perceived problematic member of a panel. Uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, it took 12 years, but I have, to, uh, I have to pass the torch, so thank you, Bob. Anytime. <laughs> he doesn't mean me, by the I'm way. Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna have to build. I'm gonna have to build up from scratch now. Uh, you know, uh, the discussion about the Gospels is uh, is an interesting one that Charles uh, invoked, uh, especially his uh, his discussion with uh, with a Muslim businessman, which of course mm. in in Muslim circles means a Muslim scholar, um, by his by his own uh, self appointment, and. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what I suspect he probably meant was the gospel with a capital G of Jesus, that there is a, um, a pristine, uh, perfected gospel that, that, that exists uh, that had been adulterated either by ling linguistic construction or by uh, political or other illicit manipulation. So he was saying mm -hmm. that there is this, this, mm -hmm. this pure one that's out there. Mm -hmm. and, and regarding um, Ghazali, uh, well, not Ghazali, but uh, uh, Al-Jabari, and the 88 uh, uh, Gospels, you poll any Muslim and he or she will say that their favorite Gospel, with a small g in this sense compared to the Gospel of Jesus, is the Gospel of Barnabas. Yeah. Because in the Gospel of Barnabas, uh, you know, one of the apocryphal uh, uh, Gospels, uh, it says that Jesus names someone who will come after him uh, with the phrase, uh, the praiseworthy, or hamd, uh, which is of course then a derivative of the word Ahmed, which of course itself is an abbreviated form of Muhammad, the praiseworthy. So uh, the Gospel of Barnabas is uh, next to a copy of Gideon's because we get them free, uh, something that you will probably find in many Muslim libraries uh, if you were to, to visit. So I think that that's really fascinating about, uh, about the Gospel of Barnabas. I think it's also important though to recognize, since this is a con uh, conversation about history and particularly as, as, as you said, Scott, about methodology, Jesus comes to Islam through what Muslims perceive to be and what Muslims believe to be with their faith, the inerrancy of the Quran. So I suppose in that sense they would be guilty of this circuitous argument of saying, well, if the Quran says it and if God wrote the Quran, then therefore it has to be true. Uh, and also the veracity that they place in Muhammad himself as being one who recounts these stories. But it's also important to recognize that Jesus comes to Arabia, and an Arabia which is at the time still a dominant uh, pagan Arabia through secondary sources, through the hearsay of narratives, either because of the commercial intercourse on the western side of the Arabian Peninsula and stories uh, being recounted I mean, this is in the days, of course, before social media, as we understand it, uh, and technology, that people would actually talk to one another in more than 140 characters when they, were, uh, when they were coming through on caravan trades. These stories became known, and these stories became presumed to be true as historical accounts. And it's also important to recognize that this was a society which was, by large, an oral tradition society. So the idea of being able to go into the archives, into the scrolls, and into the quote-unquote primary texts simply wouldn't occur. And so methodologically speaking, um, one has to defer to uh, this being the way that stories and history would have been passed uh, along 
uh, through the generations at that time. So. Further comments? As one thing I can't resist pointing out, I had this really unusual church some years ago, uh, and uh, on Trinity Sunday, we had the local Muslim imam come in. Uh, on, on, of course, on Reformation Sunday, we had a Catholic monk come in, so we always wanted to be in dialogue. Well, uh, I really blew the imam's mind by having a liturgical reading from the Gospel of Barnabas. Uh, he's, he was about to say how Christians don't know about this book. Well, except for you. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a fascinating work, that's for yeah. sure. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I wanted a, a, the punchline of this was, I'm going senile. Uh, I love this. The, I preached on this once. That's what I was thinking. Uh, that uh, I love the picture of the church, quote, unquote, the following of Jesus in the story of Peter's confession, where it presupposes that loads of people are following Jesus and love Jesus, and Jesus has not been teaching them anything about who he is because he says... Um, who do people say that I am? He knows that the disciples have more immediate contact with the crowd. They say, well, some say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others think you're Elijah or one of the other biblical prophets. And uh, then he says, well, how about you? What do you say? And uh, he says, you are the, Peter says, you are the Christ. We don't know if the other ones would have said the same thing. But we always think, well, yeah, it's leading up to uh, the right answer from Peter, which I guess it is. But I think, wait just a second. How about if those who are interested in Jesus could go back to that pre-Peter punchline uh, stage and say, yeah, we got all kinds of ideas about who Jesus is or was, etc. Uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who are you, what have you sacrificed, as Scripture says. Uh, and uh, that, that, I think, is like a post- or pre-dogmatic view. Why, why do you have to be... Uh, straight jacketed or, or divided by theologies. If you think there's something magnetic and, and, uh, and striking about Jesus, that's, that ought to be enough. So we understood that there are people that say, because something in the gospel is true, everything should be true. Then we have people that say, because something in the gospel is certainly wrong, everything should be wrong. And then uh, there are the people that, in my opinion, are uh, more right, like myself. <laughs> <laughs> that they say that the truth is in, in, uh, in between. Okay? That not everything that is written in the gospel uh, is accurate from the historical point of view. But this is, doesn't, doesn't mean that everything that is written in the gospel uh, is necessarily non-accurate from the historical point of view. And the task of a historian is exactly to divide what is historically accurate and what is not, exactly as the son of man goes with the sheep and the goats. <laughs> okay, well, why don't we um, turn now to some questions. And uh, since I'm the organizer, I get one that I get to ask. And so let's start with that uh, quickly. So uh, one of the things that's interesting uh, certainly in the course that I'm teaching and other courses that I have taught, and this is a comment really for the whole panel, is that as, as people know, one of the things that's so fascinating about the historical Jesus today, if you go into any bookstore you can see this, is that there are so many different theories about what he was like. You can read about Jesus as a healer, uh, as an exorcist, uh, as uh, uh, Dean Hershock uh, said in referencing the new book Zealot, uh, Jesus is a political revolutionary, certainly an idea that does not start with uh, this new book but really has very deep roots, Jesus as a community organizer, and so on and so forth. And so I, I wanted to ask the panel, do, uh, how would you process this? Do, do, do any of these portraits strike uh, the panel historically as more plausible than the next? Um, how, would, how would students or, or anyone in sort of grappling with all of these different pictures of Jesus that are presented to us uh, by uh, mainstream and, and popular scholarship, um, can they be reconciled or what would be your take on that? Well, I think, I think your, uh, your perspective is, uh, uh, references a, a deep problem that we necessarily face and that is what is authoritative? And how do you decide what's authoritative? And, and, and no doubt the internet has uh, exacerbated that issue, you know, what's a, what's a reliable source, what's not a reliable source. I used to tell students, um, for me it was very easy. I'd just go to the religion section at Borders and see the books that Borders sold. 
Now, of course, the borders went out of business. I'm out of business uh, at the same time with that argument. But uh, it, is, it is a problem. It is a problem that the Jesus Seminar itself faced. And the Jesus Seminar, in spite of all the criticism, uh, took on the issue of the historical Jesus within the American setting more deeply, more profoundly than any other, um, you know. So that's certainly a very good place to start. Um, but the, the thing to understand, and, and they took a lot of heat because they voted on what, you know, uh, passage by passage, four colors, red, pink, gray, and black, in terms of the likelihood Jesus said it, then they eventually did that with the stories. But, but the thing to understand, and, they, and people laughed at that, but the thing to understand is that it was, and you know from your own, mm. it was a corroborative, it was a group that, that was arguing it out, and that's why they voted. So it was an attempt to get at this question, authority. And they said, well, the best we can do is to get reputable scholars together, have them hash it out, take a vote, and publish it. I mean, so, but it's a, it's a legitimate question. Mm. Can they all be true would be another way of framing the question, all of these different ideas, yeah. I mean, I think that, again, looking at it methodologically, we're, we're, we've got a historiography here. We have books and we have narratives that are in conversation with each other trying to form, if, if you'll pardon the expression, a mosaic of, uh, of what these characters were, were like. And uh, I think that the marketplace today, and let's face it, uh, characters like Jesus, characters like Muhammad, uh, so many uh, historical figures, and I guess now I should put those in, in quotation marks, uh, are commodities. And uh, there's a marketplace for these ideas and for the idea of having new spins put on it. I mean, anybody who is trying to get a book published has to go through a lit review and has to persuade the, uh, the publisher that this is different from some other book. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, these days, what's more salacious or what's more sexy uh, tends, to, uh, tends to grab the attention because that is outside the pale. But you're talking also about needing to recognize the consumer's perspective, the consumer's agenda, the consumer's bias, and the consumer's receptivity to picking up the book. And I think it's more of a matter of causality that our scholars or our lay people writing these books because this is a research area that truly interests them, or they find that this is an area that there is a niche market that they can then exploit. The other thing, I think, when it comes to asking how many of these things are true, Scott, is, again, looking at the consumer. Is the consumer trying to find absolutes and definitive rulings from figures that have a religious aspect to them, like Jesus, like Muhammad, etc.? When most of the work that has been provided by these people has been in the form of allegory, abstracts, or abstractions, parables, and, uh, and platitudes. And yet we as a society seem to have such a low uh, uh, threshold for, uh, for these kinds of devices. We're looking for things that are specific. We're looking for exactitudes. We're looking for certitudes. And we're looking for somebody else to tell us these things in 140 characters or less. And therefore, we're looking for books that will provide the angle of Jesus the economist, Jesus the neoliberal, Jesus the capitalist, Jesus the globalist, uh, and, and, and equally, we find this even within Islamic uh, narratives. Um, you know, the, the late, great uh, Marxist Jewish uh, uh, scholar, Maxim Rodanson, uh, wrote a, a book on uh, a biography on, on the prophet. Uh, being an atheist, being a Marxist, and being Jewish, he wasn't going to necessarily accept the narrative of the revelation. Uh, but he provides a wonderful account of, uh, of Muhammad as a social and political revolutionary that even Foucault would have bought this book. Uh, because it, 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 it shows, even Foucault, uh, about, about the power dynamics. And it was a wonderful book. I mean, for me, reading it as a historian, I thought it was a, it was a fantastic book. I know for some Muslims, they would have passed by the uh, borders, rest in peace, uh, and, and said, uh, I'm not reading that book because it mentions Marx in the same breath as it mentions Muhammad. So I think we have to recognize what are the cons what's the consumer bringing to the table when we look at these books? Yes, let's turn it open to the audience now. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I won't actually have questions, but I I have a couple comments that I wanted to say to the first three guys that are sitting on this side. First, I'm a little bit irritated that the guy that looks like the Santa Claus that you would say that that Jesus did not exist, he wasn't historical, and all of that. 
that was kind of irritating to me because if you go back, if you say you read and you, you read the, the um, New Testament and the Old Testament, it, it has um, accurate that they were saying that they didn't say um, the Messiah, they said the Savior was going to be coming. And, and all of those books in, in the um, Old Testament, it was telling you it was leading up to Jesus is um, being born or whatever. And somebody asked about the, the number of books. There's 26 books in the Bible. So it's like for you guys to say that, and it's, you have people that may be trying to, to, to go to church to try to see who Jesus is or who God is. And with you all telling them these things, that's, that's being hypocritical. And it's like for you to, you have all these young people in here and you telling them these things, that's not right. And to the guy that's in the black, you said that Jesus told um, his disciples it was going to be someone else coming after him. He did say that, but he said it was going to be the Holy Spirit, which was the Holy Ghost that was going to come after him. So, I mean, which he was still going to be with us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all one. And that's all I wanted to say. And for you to say that Jesus didn't exist, that's like horrible. It really is. Uh, if I could just say that the source that I, that I cited uh, wasn't written by any Muslim. It was the Gospel of Barnabas, which is... Uh, I don't even know who Barnabas is. And I, 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 would, I would welcome you to check uh, out the study. library. It's if you study, uh, to learn new things is a good thing. Okay? To learn new things is a good thing. So I would like to invite uh, all of you to study, to learn, because the only way to make historical statement uh, is through study and the process of learning. So no one has the truth uh, in, uh, in the pocket. Imran. This is for Saeed. So one thing that I, so coming from a Muslim background myself, one thing I find a little disturbing is, and I think you'll probably agree, it sort of came up tacitly in your, in your speech, was there seems to be a lack of engagement with what, you know, you guys would call historical biblical criticism uh, in the Muslim community. Now, there are arguments for this that I won't go into, but I just wanted to know, in your opinion, how much of a problem is that? Mm. Given that we know, at least in a handful of cases, there are direct contradictions between what historical research tells us about Jesus and so on, uh, and what you find in the Quran. Now, you mentioned Reza Aslan. I haven't read the book, but in an interview, if I'm not, and maybe you can correct me since you know him as a friend, in an interview he says that, Jesus was definitely crucified. He so says, there's no doubt about that. Okay. Now, you read the Quran, and the Quran says, well, no, he wasn't, but it was sort of made to appear to people that he was now. What are the merits of that as a historical explanation? I don't know. Um, there are parts in the Quran where the Quran seems to think that the Trinity consists of God the Father, Mary, and Jesus, which, as any traditional Christian will tell you, is not true. Right? So there are clashes. How disturbed do you think a Muslim should be when you have these contradictions between, between history and what the Quran tells us? Well, I mean, I, th I think that's a great question, and, and I think it shows what, what Charles was, uh, was describing in his talk, is, uh, is a chasm, uh, perhaps more irreconcilable uh, between faith and history than there is a chasm between ostensibly Christianity and Islam. And, and how do you then use uh, devices w uh, of scholarship and methodology which, which differ on several different axes? I mean, one is this idea of the bleed from what is historical to what is considered historical. And, and as any, any academic will tell you that uh, you go far back enough, and particularly when you're dealing with oral traditions, things are starting to get murky. Uh, when it comes to the veracity and, and the, uh, the chain of transmission and, and the authenticity and the authority of these sources. So you've got that that, that, that is in, um, in, embedded in it. And then you also have, uh, have this issue of, um, of the oral versus the, uh, the written tradition. And, and you're talking about a fairly isolated area uh, geographically of the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, just to show you how isolated the Arabian Peninsula was, Neither the Byzantine Empire nor the Sasanian Empire wanted to conquer it, because if they conquered it, they would have then had to have dealt with the people. Uh, so it was, it was just a little bit too much for them to do in a cost-benefit analysis. I think the bigger problem that, that Muslims have when it comes to contemporary Muslims, when it comes to this issue, is that the rules that are going to be then invoked in looking at biblical Christian uh, 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 sources 
are then going to come back and be invoked on them. And we found that this has already been problematic by people like John Waynesboro, people like Patricia Crone, uh, people like Michael Cook, who had written and it became almost fashionable. I'm sorry to be neglecting the side of the room. Uh, uh, it became fashionable at a certain time in scholarship to talk about uh, the fact that Muhammad did not exist when he did where he did, and that Islam, if there is something called Islam, did not uh, originate in, say, Medina, but maybe 150 years uh, later farther north in Damascus. Well, what this is implying then is uh, to say that uh, at that point, there really is no Muhammad, or there's no need for a Muhammad. There is then no Quran as we understand it. It's something that is totally fabricated, and it's something that is uh, plagiarized once um, these Arabs make it up to Damascus, uh, implying that Damascus is more civilized because of the Byzantine uh, society. So that had to be walked back. And fortunately, the scholarship proved to be flimsy enough that it was, it was summarily attacked. But I got to tell you that for me, looking at those and taking offense as a Muslim uh, is, is not such a big deal. Because if I'm looking at it strictly as a Muslim, the faith issue is not going to shake me when it comes to these artificial methodologies of history. And that's how most Muslims will look at this issue. I would be deeply offended as a historian, though, if I see that there is a flimsy use of methodology. The same way that I have to concede that in the... Uh, in the end of the 19th century, in some of the finest academic journals of the time and in the Royal Society of Science, there were articles talking about the veracity, the probity, and the authenticity of craniometry as a way of determining biological science. That was considered to be methodologically sound. That was considered to have uh, all of the check marks when it came to uh, uh, scientific uh, know-how at the time. But it was scurrilous when it comes to its scholarship. You see? So that's always going to be, I think, an endemic problem and Bob, a systemic problem. Yeah, just another uh, honest difference. I've read uh, Cook and Crone and a bunch of these people. I don't think by any means it was flimsy scholarship. I think it's quite strong and significant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I uh, think that the, the uh, supposed reference to the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Virgin Mary, that may not really be what it's saying. The, the Quran shows awareness of intra-Christian debates at the time, and this may simply be a reference to uh, what Protestants would say, that the Virgin Mary is being virtually deified, not that, the doctrine of, not that they thought the doctrine of the Trinity was uh, included there. Mm -hmm. Time for a couple more? Yes. Um, yes, I suspect Bob Price is almost completely correct because the question of contemporaneous evidence. There's no contemporaneous evidence of Jesus during his lifetime. In the next 20 years, there is no evidence. In the following 20 years, you have seven letters by Paul, the legitimate seven letters. So you've got to the year 70 before you have barely a shred of evidence that a Jesus even existed. Then the Gospels start showing up, and these are from the years 70 to 100. So this makes no sense except in a kind of a contrived situation where somebody's creating a story for an ulterior motive rather than an actual historical Jesus. And I, to me, that's a key point which nobody's really talked about to this, to, this, to this point. Yeah, when people say, well, Josephus mentioned him, well, you might as well open the Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh, there's an article <laughs> about Jesus. I guess he existed. Uh, e even if Josephus wrote the passage, which I think certainly he did not, that mentions Jesus, it's got to be a Christian interpolation given the content. It wouldn't matter anyway because the guy's writing decades too late. He's not an on-the-scene reporter. He's simply reflecting what Christians in his day said as far as we know. Josephus was 93. Yeah. Right? So that, that, was, that was far too late. So we have, not, we have no, it's impossible to have no contemporaneous evidence if the Jesus story is true. It's, it's, it's bueno. virtually impossible. Bueno. Bueno. We have a lot of, uh, of historical characters uh, 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 of whom we don't have contemporary evidence. It's not, uh, it's not exceptional. The situation of Jesus uh, is not exceptional. If we follow this criteria, we should cancel from our uh, books of history the 90% of the characters in our books. Well, 90% of them aren't said to have changed water into wine, walked on water, <laughs> flown then, into heaven yes, bodily. But, but nobody's saying that Jesus was changing water. I mean, there were miracle workers. I was not there. I don't know what he did. But I know that at the time of Jesus, there were people who were believed to be miracle workers. I mean, we have even today in, in some societies, people that are working as miracle workers. The fact that Jesus was considered a miracle worker. That's the least part of the that story. Does not, that doesn't mean that Jesus, what Jesus did were miracles. This is a different matter. Uh, so 
obviously, obviously, what, what bothers me a lot is that a lot of people that are studying the gospel are making these bold opinions, know nothing about the Second Temple Judaism, are not experts of Judaism. So you asked before, uh, uh, who are the authors you trust more? I say, I, I trust more people that are specialists of Second Temple Judaism. Because, uh, of course, uh, you, you made the case of Superman. Superman, uh, according uh, to, the, to, the, to the comics, uh, to the cartoons, uh, was born in the 30s, okay, if I remember correctly. Okay, I don't have any evidence of other Superman in the 30s. So, the, the, the character is completely misplayed about, uh, uh, in comparison with everything I know about the 30s. But if I'm a specialist in Second Temple Judaism, in first century Judaism, and I study the literature of the period, the book of the parables uh, of, of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, all the literature produced at the time, etc. Not only the Gospels, reading the, what are the ideas that were discussed at the time. The character of Jesus makes perfect sense in that environment. This doesn't mean that everything that Jesus, uh, that everything that is written in the Gospel really happened as it is written in the Gospel. I agree perfectly with you that what we have is a mythological rewriting of, an of, uh, of the life of an historical character, a mythological rewriting. Yes, what I have in the Gospel, everything in the Gospel is written according to mythological paradigms. I perfectly agree. But I still believe, I think that the evidence is overwhelming, that behind this myth, this myth there, is, there was an historical character. At least a historical character as plausible as many other historical characters. If I want to create a myth, I don't create a myth at the time of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was an historical character or not? Probably. Probably, yes. Uh, Caiaphas was an historical character, Pontius Pilate was an historical character. So they located this character exactly in a certain time. Okay? And everything I know about this character makes some sense. Of course, this doesn't mean that Jesus was born as a, uh, uh, from a virgin, uh, uh, as a virgin or, or, or made miracles. I don't know. I was not there. And in any case, we cannot prove a miracle. But I see more plausible the idea that there was a historical character, and then his life was transformed into a mythology. Mm -hmm. It seems more likely. OK, well, we have time for a couple more questions. Let's try to keep the answers brief so we yes. can move around this man in the back. Yes, John? Yes, well, um, logically speaking, I really can't see why there has to be a difference between a historical Jesus and a mythological Jesus. Like, I mean, the way I think of it is that if God exists, then he can do anything. And if he can do anything, Jesus can perform miracles and stuff. So I see that as that it can be historically accurate and mythical at the same time. But it doesn't have to necessarily be, we don't have to exactly have evidence for everything. But it could have actually, literally, factually happened. But so like God could do anything, does that mean he's done everything everybody ever claimed he did? I mean, if miracles are possible, legends and myths are still possible. So it's not like saying, well, if miracles can happen, then I'll sign on for the whole thing. There's no way to know. I mean, you have to look at evidence in every case. Uh, and uh, that, that just opens the question. It doesn't close it. Anything could have happened, but the historian wants to know what likely happened. And without a time machine, you can just weigh the evidence and come to only provisional conclusions. Over here? Yes. Uh, I have a question more about the motivation of the early Christian movement. Um, in particular, when it comes to perpetuating the message of the resurrection, I guess I'm just wondering what was, obviously there was a cost to continuing this message early on um, in those first decades. Not necessarily. It, the uh, the devotees of other dying and rising saviors weren't persecuted for it. Uh, and when early Christians, not quite the earliest ones we know of, were put to death, uh, it's really a, a modern myth to say that uh, they, they must have really known that Jesus rose from the dead or they wouldn't have given their lives for it. That doesn't follow. They must have believed it. But that's no evidence about what happened. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not arguing that. I'm not just asking. Mm. What is the motivation? What's the advantage, for instance, of uh, well, Paul uh, to write the letters? What does that gain him, especially 
considering his. Well, they they believed thing, all right? the stuff. It just like Mithraists believed uh, that Mithras slew the cosmic bull to renew the cosmos, and various other ones. They, they certainly believed it, but that's it's a whole different issue as to where those beliefs came from. And it's very difficult to tell. This gentleman here, yes. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been 30 some years since I've been in a college classroom. <laughs> and I um, compliment all the panelists and you for honoring me. So now you've fallen off the wagon. No, but I have a simple yes no question for each one of the panelists. And the question has to do is that this is all based on historical. Let's go before Jesus. Let's go back to the time of Pro Magnum Man. A lot of your discussions start with Adam, the early testament. The question that I have is simply yes or no. How do each of you feel, believe in natural evolution? That man started as pro magnum man, and what do your beliefs teach you? Because if you look at Adam in the First Testament, it's a little contradiction. Natural evolution. Uh, evolution is not a matter of belief, it is science. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in science? Yes or no? Obviously, I mean, I, I yes. Okay. What I mean? I mean it's not a matter of believing. You don't believe in science. You don't, don't believe in science. I mean, science, understand. the Bible is not a book of science. Okay. So, uh, so it's not a matter of believing. Uh, it's not that I believe in science uh, in evolution and you believe in creationism and these are two beliefs. No, I mean, science is one thing, religion is another. Science, if I want to know how the, the universe uh, was born, I ask scientists. Okay. So you would say yes. Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. Accept evolution. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Saeed, do you want to take a stab at that or quickly? Uh, yes. Do you want to have a comment at that? Uh, yeah, I do have a comment. Um, I was going to say earlier, and I, this uh, um, question raised it uh, uh, explicitly, and that is that historical criticism of the Bible, the heartland of historical criticism, is Germany. And the motivation of the historical critics, and I take Albert Schweitzer as the famous you know, example in the quest for the historical Jesus, 1903, was to save Christianity. It was not to destroy Christianity. It was to save Christianity for the modern scientific world. Science was presupposed to be true. And that's really what's at stake here underneath the, the discussion that we have. And, and I think your question really gets at it. What's at stake is your belief in science. And in America, which has, has uh, received the impulse, if you will, of historical criticism and biblical scholarship uh, for the last 70 or 80 years, it's, an Im it's in a sense an import from Germany. And in America, the kind of discussion that we had today, uh, a kind of secondary discussion around the original intent of the methodology. It's, it's, it's interesting from a sociological standpoint. That's reassuring. My car is German. Um, <laughs> uh, from, from, from an Islamic standpoint, the answer is yes and no. Uh, according to Islamic tradition, um, the world has been uh, created and destroyed several times over. Uh, which would then explain the gaps in the archaeological record. So according to that uh, interpretation, uh, it's, it's quite plausible that the, uh, the fossils, the, skeleton, uh, the skeletal remains of Cro-Magnon Man, etc., would be something that had been created as a prior, uh, a prior creation. And That's correct. But to say that um, somehow the other... Uh, Homo sapien man, as we understand him or her today, came directly from um, the womb of a Cro-Magnon woman is, uh, is, is not something that Islam necessarily recognizes. Okay, I have time for two more quick questions. Sam? Um, thank you, Professor Saeed. Mr. Price, it's a very interesting viewpoint. I've never heard my questions for Mr. Price. Um, you said that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but you said that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but you said that Jesus was uh, real and then using that, but what would then originally start the Christian movement? 
I think it was an evolution, an adaptation of the kind of, well, of three things in, in terms of what survived as Christianity. I think it's, it's like a tripod underneath it, the, the mystery cults, the, the initiation religions of Attis, Osiris, Hercules, and various others uh, whose uh, death and resurrection originally were vegetation myths, but later were transformed into myths of personal rebirth and resurrection. Uh, there was apparently an ancient uh, Israelite version of that that's preserved here and there uh, that uh, in, in the Psalms and so on that uh, picture Jehovah like Marduk and other dying and rising gods. So it may go way back in archaic Israel, Israelite religion, but it doesn't really matter. It's a kind of a syncretistic stew where... Uh, uh, in Ezekiel, they talk about women uh, in Jerusalem mourning ritually the death of Tammuz and so on. They, they knew this stuff for, for many centuries. They may simply have taken the name Jesus, an epithet meaning savior, and applied it to one of these and it became the name. Uh, secondly, there was Gnosticism, which I think was a pre-Christian development, the belief that the world was fallen and evil and that uh, the unknown father sent a redeemer and a revealer, kind of like Morpheus in the Matrix, uh, to <laughs> gather the sparks of the divine. And then uh, thirdly, the, uh, the Greco-Roman hero cults, which often uh, in the ancient novels of the time involved uh, the, the hero getting crucified but surviving it and, and so on. I think that these three elements joined to uh, form what we know as Christianity and they all have long roots in the Greco-Roman and Middle Eastern uh, worlds. In front of me, yeah, last question. I've got to get uh, Dr. Price back uh, to the airplane. Well, Dr. Morpheus Price the and, um, the gentleman on the end whose name is Mongeria. Yeah, 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 yeah. how, how could but I, I guess I'd like the opinion as to how, whether uh, Dr. Price's idea has any plausibility in a first century Jewish setting or Second Temple Judaism in terms of the arising of a religion within a, a Jewish environment as uh, I think everyone would agree Christianity did arise. Maybe, maybe not. It might have started in Alexandria. That's been argued by some for a long time. But then what, what, it was clearly accepted within Jewish, within some harsh portion of the Jewish community. I'm just asking for a... Well, let me just give one uh, example I think is important. At the Last Supper, at least in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, we have Jesus explaining the... the um, bread and the wine as devouring his flesh and blood. Now, of course, I'm assuming that's some sort of metaphor, but to imagine that had any place in any form of Judaism we know of, that's like blood drinking imagery. That's as if you had child molestation imagery. It's simply unthinkable, whereas it fits perfectly in the religions of Osiris and Dionysus, with which some Jews were familiar and practiced for many centuries before. So I think the uh, the uh, Jewish Jesus is a kind of Judaizing of Jesus, just like others made him into a cynic philosopher. I don't think you can, sim uh, Christians like to say that uh, Jesus must be interpreted as a Jew because, I mean religiously, not some sort of sectarian Jew, but kind of orthodox, uh, because uh, they, they, that way it seems to come more directly out of the Old Testament, which is their theology. They just don't like the idea that there were these other feed-ins, and I think there were, and it's hard to know where Christianity began and which of these factions. Else? It's undeniable that the New Testament is, is thoroughly Jewish. So I, don't, uh, I don't think that's true. I, I'm not sure if there were any Jewish writers. I think the works all come from the very late first to early second century. The letters of Paul, which view the law as an intolerable burden, no Jew could have written that. Paul says that God's judgment has come upon the Jews at last because they're the enemies of humanity. No Jew could have written that. Uh, of, he, he uses mystery religion, uh, soteriology. His uh, knowledge of the Bible, uh, the way he uses it is like the Nag Hammadi Gnostics. It has nothing in common with Judaism, W.D. Davies uh, and his Paul and Rabbinic Judaism, to the contrary. That's proven an empty well, in my I opinion. Like what sure. About the, uh, the obviously, obviously here we have an opposite view. I mean, uh, when I read the New Testament, uh, I see a Jewish text. For me, the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, John, uh, uh, Thomas are Jewish texts. The letters of Paul are Jewish texts. They are attribute Jewish texts. to. They are written by Jews. They are written according to Jewish categories. There is nothing in this text that does not belong to Second Temple Judaism. You made the example of the Last Supper. Uh, bread and wine were the ones that were present in the, in the blessing of, of Passover. 
and Jesus uh, is celebrating Passover, not even according to the, to the ritual of the temple, he's celebrating Passover according to the ritual of the scene groups. Uh, I cannot imagine a, a Roman that knew how the scenes were celebrating Passover. Uh, that's a circular argument. Okay. And then I cannot, see, I cannot see how somebody that wants to create a superhero <laughs> is picking up the two most common names uh, in Judaism. You know that the Jews in the Second Temple period uh, were named their children using only 16 names. 16 names. And Jesus Ben Yosef is one of the most common names. So if you say, I mean, you cannot pick the name Jesus as Savior. I mean, it's, it's like uh, call somebody Bill, okay, not Superman. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if, you study, if you study Greek, uh, Jewish, uh, Hebrew epigraphy, you know that the most common combination of names uh, you have uh, in, uh, in the tombs uh, in the Second Temple is Joshua and Yosef. I mean, uh, there was, uh, there was uh, uh, well, two years ago, this documentary of the tomb of Jesus. Uh, we found uh, Jesus, uh, the, the Joshua and Yosef, uh, this is the tomb of Jesus. I mean, you go to the museum, uh, the Hebrew the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, uh, you go in, uh, in, the, in the cellar and you see hundreds and hundreds of, uh, 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 of these tombs, of these boxes. Uh, contain, okay, Osuaris, uh, sorry, Osuaris uh, with the writing of Joshua and Yosef. I mean, it's not that we have uh, 100 Jesuses. Uh, so, I think that uh, the idea of a son of man, uh, the idea of the end of times, the kingdom of God, uh, these are not ideas that were popular uh, in Hellenistic uh, in, in environment. These are ideas that were popular uh, in Jewish apocalyptic circles. So I, 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 I think, OK, this is a legitimate conversation. I like it very much, because uh, when we have uh, different opinions, uh, it's very lively. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't agree on the fact that this is, not, uh, this is not compatible with what we know from Judaism. I'm a specialist of Judaism, but these are Jewish texts. I don't see anything in this text uh, that contradicts what I know about the second temple, first century Judaism. I repeat, this does not mean that everything that is written in, uh, in the gospel is accurate. This doesn't mean that one thing is, is accurate, everything is, ac is not. And I perfectly agree with you that what we have is a story that is rewritten in a mythological form. That's true. All right, well, I have to get Dr. Price to the airport, so let's leave it there. If people want to carry on, uh, uh, this room is open till 7 o'clock. Thank you very much. Give our speakers a warm welcome.